Yeah, which is what I had to do. Well, gentlemen, good to see you and be with you again as we take another Thursday to look into God's Word. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us first, and then we'll take a look into where I've been before in 2 Timothy. I've chosen 2 Timothy to share with a lot this year, simply because it's the last thing that Paul wrote, and it had some urgency about where things are going in life and where things are going in the church and where things are going in our own personal lives. Some very important, helpful information when times get tough. Does that sound familiar? So in a moment, we'll take a look at 2 Timothy, beginning in verse 13, if you want to go ahead and find your place there. Meanwhile, let's pray. Well, Father, thank you again for the privileged opportunity to gather in your name, and we thereby dedicate this gathering across the distances, across the internet, as a place where you can come and take over. Where two or three are gathered in that name, we are promised that your presence will be there, and so we welcome you here. We yield to you. We let you take the pulpit and teach us, maybe not even through the words that I or others speak, but you teach us through the Holy Spirit, something we have to hear. So help us to make sense of what Paul wrote thousands of years ago to his protege, Timothy. May we listen, hear, and heed what he said. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, gentlemen, we're going to look at 2 Timothy, as I said. Hopefully, you're seeing that on the screen. Uh, whoop, I'm at the wrong place. We've got to start that over. Uh, excuse me. Love it when it works. Here we go. There we go. Uh, we're going to talk a little about guarding something. Uh, I was going to begin by asking, when was the last time you were robbed? Something very important or expensive or priceless was taken from you. I remember being a college student at UNC and Saturday morning got up to go to the football game. And as was my custom, I usually grabbed my clothes and went down to Roy Rogers Chicken. It used to be over there, Roy Rogers Roast Beef and Chicken. And we'd grab a bunch of uh, chicken and go get in line to enter the stadium only when I got in the line and ordered my, fu my food, I reached in my wallet and it wasn't a single dollar in there. And the night before I'd gone to the ATM machine, I had at least $100 in there. Well, it turns out somebody stole a master key in our dorm and gone up and down the floor and had opened about 14 rooms. And in the middle of the night, while I was sleeping with my blue jeans, one foot from my head with my wallet in the back pocket, he had taken that wallet out and taking a hundred dollars. I did find it funny the next morning that my blue jeans were laying on the floor. And, and I remember how violated I felt uh, at that moment that someone had stolen something from me. Plus I wasn't gonna have any chicken for the football game. So it was a double whammy. Can you think of a time you had something so precious you wanted to guard it intently? Uh, banks have these incredible vaults and places for securing valuables in the safe deposit boxes. I don't know how many of you have those still, but today we're talking about something more valuable than money. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's going to tell young Timothy, guard the good deposit. And that's what our text is all about today. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, look with me beginning in verse 13. Paul says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Here it is. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. In the rest of the verse, he goes on to say, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. He's talking about some people who have given up on the gospel, given up on him. He's in prison. He said, some of those that deserted him are Phygelus and Homogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to a, an exception to that, the house of Onesephorus. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know all the, all, all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Three things I want to talk about briefly and give us a lot of time to discuss it among ourselves. What is this deposit, this good deposit 
that the Apostle Paul is talking about when, when he talks to young Timothy. Secondly, why do we need to guard it? What's in jeopardy here? Why would it ever be taken or stolen? And thirdly, how do we do it? What are the keys that Paul mentions here for guarding the good deposit? Well, first of all, we have to sort of go back and look at the earlier verses of 1 Timothy, where Paul mentions that God is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And so soon after that, next couple of verses, he says, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This word deposit used twice now, what's he talking about? Well, it's an interesting Greek word, parathekin, which talks about a deposit or a trust or a thing consigned to one's faithful keeping. Anybody ever give you something to watch and guard, maybe while they were away, look out for my house or look out for my mail or watch my pets or water my plants? That's, that's kind of the idea here. But on a spiritual sense, we're talking about the you. it's used here of the correct knowledge and the pure doctrine of the gospel to be held firmly and faithfully and not to just be guarded, but to be conscientiously delivered to others. Guard it and share it is basically the message here. Well, what exactly are we talking about? He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Key here, what you have heard from me. This isn't the first time Paul and Timothy have communicated. He's already sent a previous letter, but more importantly, read the book of Acts and you see that Timothy became a very close inner circle missionary partner with Paul, traveled with him many places. And so in the course of many encounters, orally, Paul was telling Timothy what he knew, what he had experienced with Christ, a whole host of things. But it wasn't written down yet. That's the New Testament that would follow. This is pretty much the words he has heard from the Apostle Paul sort of an oral summary or outline of the basic truths of the gospel that Paul gave to Timothy previously. And we can only imagine, but we can probably guess pretty closely what that would sound like. The list would include all the teachings of Jesus that Paul knew about, certainly all the examples of Jesus' life, like washing feet and uh, being a humble servant, things like that. Also, the whole centrality of the cross was in Paul's oral message and the resurrection that would come along to confirm that. I'm sure he talked to Timothy about the fact that they were saved by grace and not by works. Don't get caught up in the Pharisees' way of getting religious. It's all about grace. And because of that, when you receive that gift of eternal life, it, you respond with gratitude. Your whole motivation is to give based on gratitude. And that helps us and motivates us to live the complete Christian life and not just be unthankful, but thankful, and then share that message with other people. This is just my list. I think this would pretty much be a beginning list or an outline of the deposit that young Timothy must have gotten over the years with Paul. And he said, guard that. Don't let that get stolen. Don't let that be taken. Well, what's the jeopardy here? Why do we need to guard that? Why is it so important, Paul telling Timothy this at the end of Paul's life, where he's about to find execution from the hands of Nero? What's important about guarding it? Well, there is a problem, and you know this problem. Peter talks about it. Paul talks about it. He said, Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have an enemy. That's no news flash to this group. We have someone that's not happy that we've got good deposits. We're, he's not happy that we've had the benefit of listening to people like Danny Lotz and Albert Long and Stephen Crotz and Donnie Jones and Rick and myself every now and then, and all the churches and all the messages you've heard and all the Bible studies you've been a part about and all the good teaching you've accumulated of your lifetime. This is a threat to the domain of darkness. This is a threat to Satan. And so what he chooses to do is to steal, to kill, to destroy. Jesus said it that way. John 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. That's his mission. I have come, Jesus said, that you may have life and have it to the full. You couldn't have more polar opposites in mission. So we got to guard what we have. We can't allow the thief to take that. 
And if you think about it, over the time we have been Christians, in our own lifetime, we have watched both society and even our churches begin to disintegrate from some of this good deposit. Some people aren't teaching everything Jesus said anymore. They've just sort of ignored it or bypassed it or modified it. Some of the examples of Jesus seem to be out of favor to these days. The centrality of the cross is not necessarily in every sermon preached these days. Some even doubt the resurrection ever took place. It's a good story, but it literally didn't happen, some people are saying. Grace versus works? No, we live in a culture where you earn it. You can't just get it by gift, so that's gone in some teaching. And even that, you know, it's not a gift. you got to work for it. So therefore, I'm not grateful. I'm proud of what I've done. And so as our end result, what the Christian life looked like 100 years ago or 2,000 years ago has been stolen. And are we telling the message to anybody anymore? Untold thousands are dying untold. There's a lot of thievery going on. We've got a great deposit. We've got the message of Jesus Christ, but it's been robbed. It's been stolen. Basic message is shut up, Christian. Don't tell that story anymore. That's out of fashion. We're living in a culture now of censorship, a culture that says if you believe absolute truth or biblical values, you need to zip it up. We don't want to hear what you have to say anymore. We're watching that play out in social media where people are being knocked off of all those accounts where they otherwise had a platform. We're, we're watching our news media say, uh, we're only going to report what we want you to hear. That censorship, that silencing is going on. That's a thievery from what we're so supposed to do because so much of the gospel isn't, like I said, just guarding it, but sharing it. That's what Edmund Burke meant when he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men with the good deposit to do nothing. And we've watched this in our culture, haven't we? The erosion of the values that some of us can remember not so long ago were more in vogue. I want to share with you just briefly a couple quotes from a book. Notice this book was put out in April of 2015, before the presidential election two times ago. It's an interesting title, The Cost of Our Silence, Consequences of Christians Taking the Path of Least Resistance. Because the resistance against us is to shut up. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. Here's what David Fiorazzo says. I know small print, so I'll read it. It says, how are we, Christians, contributing to the collapse of this great country? Unless we admit the truth and act accordingly, this nation is toast. Evil began knocking centuries ago, but in the last hundred years, and particularly in the last 50, so that's in our lifetime, gentlemen, we thrust the door wide open and invited evil in. Rather than resist the sin that used to repulse us and cause us deep remorse, we have warmed up to it and have welcomed godlessness in, with open arms, tolerance, grace, and a judge ye not attitude are the norm in many churches, while repentance and holiness have practically become four-letter words. He goes on to say, our country has forgotten how to blush and has cast aside all moral restraint while forgetting our Christian history. Profanity and adultery are commonplace. The murder of babies in the womb is legal and often celebrated. We have perverse parades, judicial tyranny, and a power-grabbing government with no accountability. Remember, this was written in 2015. A biased and progressive media cheers for immorality, Christless education, and makes a mockery of marriage. Our land is filled with too many permissive pastors, lukewarm Christians, and sin justifiers, while same-sex promoters godless entertainment consumers, evolution defenders, and satanic sympathizers are celebrating. We, Christians, we allow Hollywood to dump filthy garbage into our living room, and as a result, we become 
we welcome witchcraft, blasphemy, and the glorification of sin. We, Christians, have become desensitized to the influence of liberalism, not just within our country, but within the church. G. Davis, tell us what you really think. I mean, he shoots it with both barrels here because we, who should be guarding the deposit and sharing the deposit, have failed in some measure. We see the manifestations all around us. So if that's the case, what do we need in the terms of keys for guarding this deposit? How can we go out of a Bible study like this more prepared to guard it and to share it? Well, it's right there in the text. In 1 Timothy, 1, 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me. Very first key here is look at the model, look at the example, look at the pattern of Paul. What did he do with the deposit? He told everybody he could tell. Uh, it reminds me of one of Albert Long's favorite lines. He says, when it comes to sharing the gospel, if the opportunity presents itself, take it. If the opportunity doesn't present itself, make it. Doesn't that sound like Albert? <laughs> Crowbar that conversation wide open if you can. Now, I, I may be a little more gentler. You may be more uh, uh, subtle than that. But if we have shut up, if we haven't followed the pattern of Paul, who got in trouble for opening his mouth and spilling the deposit and making another deposit in Timothy and other people everywhere he went, if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here today. So that's the first key. Look around at those people who are taking the good news and not just hoarding it, but sharing it. Follow that pattern of sound words when you see other people doing it. He says another key here is to do this in faith and in love that are in Christ Jesus. And I think this is dual because Christ loves you. And because Christ has faith in you and parallel as you have love for Christ and as you have faith in Christ, why wouldn't we share? Why wouldn't we be open? Why would we be ever be silent? He loves us. He wants us to be successful in sharing. He has faith in us. He entrusted the whole match of sharing the gospel to 11 ragtag guys on a hillside in uh, Mount of Olives when he said, go into all the world, tell this message. And understand, these were not uh, expert sharers. These were cowards in many ways, but he had faith in them. So I think that's part of it. Know that when you and I are attempting to guard the gospel and turn around and share the gospel, we got a, a cheerleader up there at the right hand of the Father cheering us on saying, go for it, go for it. I, I have faith, faith in you. I love you. But the other side of that is we ought to have faith in Christ when we share. We ought to trust more than we see with our eyes. He's doing more work behind the scenes than we can ever, ever count on. But more importantly, we do it because we love Christ. And when you love someone, you kind of like to please them. You kind of like to do the things that put a smile on their face. So there's another key. Faith and love toward Christ Jesus. Faith and love from Christ Jesus. And then here's the third key, by the Holy Spirit do this who dwells in us. <laughs> you and I can't do this. We can't guard that gospel. We can't share that gospel. Uh, that's not a human effort. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm taking some of my uh, other Bible studies through the Gospel of Luke, and we keep seeing that phrase pop up, that he was led by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. Jesus, second part of the Trinity, was empowered and led by the third part of the Trinity. He was dependent on the Holy Spirit like we should be. If Jesus had to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, <laughs> how much more do I need that? You and I cannot hold on to this. And we certainly can't share this good news, the stories of Jesus, the gospel, the cross, the resurrection, how to live the Christian life. There's no hope for doing this if we are dependent on human strength, if we are dependent on our church or our pastor to do it, or if we pay missionaries or evangelists to do that. I've told somebody who gives generously to our ministry, 
when he said, I invest in Quest because I want you to go out and share the gospel. And I asked him, I said, well, that, you know, doesn't exempt you from the opportunity. He said, oh, no, I write a bigger check so I don't have to do it. I said, as much as I appreciate that, as, as does my wife, I would rather tear this check up and hear that you were sharing the gospel in your sphere of influence. He didn't tell me to tear up the check, so I deposited it. It was a good deposit. But at the same time, I wanted him to hear me say, you know, God doesn't need a million dollar evangelist. He needs a million one dollar evangelist, and that's you and me. Follow the pattern of someone like Paul. Do it in faith and love and do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we can guard the good deposit. So remember, as Paul says to Timothy, something's been entrusted to you, something so valuable that someone wants to steal it, and that enemy will need, need to be guarded. We have to put up all the walls around it. We can't let our thoughts and our minds and our, our doctrines and our preaching go the route of the culture. We got to protect it, put some walls around it. And the way to do that is through those things of a sound pattern of doing it in faith and love and dependency on the Holy Spirit. What's the most valuable thing that you and I possess? It's that incredible good news that Jesus Christ came to this world. And though he could have spared himself from the torment, he went to the cross to die for our sins. And we by the grace of God, through the time past, through some servant of God, heard that good news, that gospel of Jesus Christ, and is come into our life. It has changed us, uh, changed us from the guttermost to the uttermost, and it's allowed us the privilege of enjoying the Christian life, even as we do on these Thursdays. So what we have to do with that, Paul says, we got to guard it, but we also need to share it. Our culture would look a lot different if for the past 50 years we haven't been asleep at the switch and let some of those safe deposit box get opened and taken out. So I want to take the rest of our time now to talk about it. Has, is this something that you have seen? Are you aware as you look around your church, the Christian culture that you and I live in, perhaps the, 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 the American culture that I do believe was founded on Christian principles? totally different belief systems 200 years ago. What is the status of the deposit in our country, in our church, and if you dare, in your own life? Open it up now and let you have a chance to share what you think about this verse and where, where are we with the good deposit? So unmute yourself, jump in here. Let's take the next 30 minutes to have a rousing discussion about it. Steve, one of the, the habits that, that I've found is so necessary in my life is to re-evangelize myself daily, mm. uh, not to let the fact that I'm a sinner, that Christ died for sinners, that I need to live a life of continuous repentance and faith. And as Paul said, to be, be, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, just to do that body check or spiritual check each day is, is part of communion with him. And coming to the Lord's table is also another way that we, we guard that to remember. Um, the Greek word for uh, in remembrance of me is anamasis. We get the word amnesia from that. And I, I think um, Americans have gotten spiritual amnesia. Great point, Stephen. Thank you. It's a shame because of our circumstances, we don't get to come to the table like we used to. And, and in, in the Life of Christ series that we did years ago, we were told that uh, as a part of the Jewish practice of marriage, engagement, betrothal, when a husband-to-be went to ask for the hand in marriage of a, a bride-to-be, he would take with him the, the money that he would pay the father for the bride price, but he also brought a little bitty 
goat skin of the family wine. And the daddy had to accept the giving of the daughter, but the daughter had to accept the proposal as well. And the way she said yes to the proposal is the, the groom-to-be would pour out a little glass of the family wine. And if she accepted that and drank that, that was her yes to the proposal. Mm -hmm. And so the person telling this story said, next time you have communion and you're holding that little cup of the family wine of the father, it's you re-upping, it's you saying yes again to the proposal of the, uh, of the king, of the bridegroom, we being the bride. And you're always renewing, like you say, when that happens. Maybe some week we ought to just tell everybody in advance, hey, bring a, a loaf of bread and a little cup of grape juice, mm -hmm. and we'll do communion virtually on the Zoom call. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I've, I've watched in, uh, <clears throat> in my time, which is quite a few years, um, I've watched the culture basically turn against real Christianity and embrace sort of a false sense of Christianity where they embrace the worldly, the churches embrace the worldly, and you, you actually get rid of the... Uh, the need for repentance because you don't have anything to repent for. And, um, and it, it really hurts me because, you know, I've, my neighbors are flying um, rainbow flags all around here. And yet I have friends who, who participate in that lifestyle whom I love, but I would never want to just, accept that lifestyle as because that's not what God accepts. And um, so the struggle is the Christians and their beliefs are um, they're, they're, they're out of step says the media, the media says it's out of step with, 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 with what they call today's truth. And so um we, we have to stand against that kind of thinking and in love, tell the truth in love. Uh, because if, if you can't get somebody to realize the, the beauty of the one who loves them and his desire for them to have what he really made them for, there's no, there's no repentance. And I think you're okay. I'm okay with being out of step. Yeah, right. Steve, what do you mean by being out of step? Well, I'm not marching to the music and in the direction of our culture. Our culture has basically said um, the Bible is a book of myths and legends and not reliable, certainly not our authoritative. We've got... Uh, a culture that basically lives under the mantra, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. And there are no morals. I mean, yeah. yeah. Whatever, you know, what does the Bible say so much of the Old Testament? Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. Gotcha. Thanks. And we are living that again today. Yeah. Hey, uh, just make a comment. I uh, recently uh, bought the old book that was written in 1949 called 1984. And it predicted exactly what you're talking about today. There is no God, whatever the past is, there's no such thing as the past. We created the new, the new history is just now and all history is gone. It's uh, staggering uh, to read. And I'm also reading uh, some other books, but I don't know how many of you get the Imprimus from Hillsdale College. Uh, if anybody does not get that, if you'd send me an email, I'll get you on the mailing list with them a wonderful college up in, uh, in Michigan. And uh, this uh, past fall, the president of the college taught four books. Uh, 1984 was one of them, but there, there are three others too, this great, late, great planet Earth and so forth. And I'm into all four of them. I haven't gotten into the last two yet, but um, talks just about what you're saying right today. All of this is gonna be destroyed. 
and you're going to believe that the devil is the right one and so forth. It's, it's really, really frightening. And when you see what the media does today, and unfortunately, I'm afraid the same thing's happening with our, with our current political situation a bit too. That's, uh, it's, it's just what was predicted back in 1949. And in 1939, the great, great planet Earth, too. So, how much of uh, how much of this do you think can be attributed to the media, and can that be controlled in any possible way? Uh, I see Elliot on this call. He might want to speak to this because uh, he he are media, uh, <laughs> but it's it, it's a big part i think there are several areas that we as christians lost decades ago we lost the educational system and so that's churning out the followers to whatever the media and the uh, governments is saying we lost government by and large we don't have uh, the same consistency of god-fearing christians or jews in government uh, and the, the late Johnny come lately there, Don, is social media, which has become somewhat more effective than the other media. And, and we could list a few other things that we just sort of slowly lost. And so it, it orchestrates when put together a culture that has readily discarded some of the truths that you and I still hold dear. And, you know, I'm tired of shaking my head over that saying, how did that happen? And yeah, there's a lot of fingers that can be pointed, but I think in the in the final analysis, Christians have got to stand up. It's not too late. I think as we evidence our faith more, as maybe the the culture or the government goes in a direction that's not going to produce what God can help us produce, people will re-examine where are we going and why are we going there. Christians will be available at that point, if not sooner, to say. Well, when you get done with that experiment, let's come on back to the truth that we all know. So in the meantime, don't lose it. That, I think it's more important now to guard that personally, guard that as a church or denomination, and not acquiesce to the culture. So media, yes. Uh, news, yes. But I think there's even more subtle things that are going on, Don. I think as much as I don't like social media, it has great influence, especially on a younger demographic. And that's churning out people who are more willing to give up on God, give up on the Bible than any other time in human history. No, I think that I meant all types of media when I said the media. I meant, as you said, that is correct. I think one of the problems we had as Christians is we've gotten too comfortable we don't want to suffer any. We don't want to be accused. We don't want to be ostracized. We don't want to be um, criticized. And we, we're just too comfortable. We don't want to, we, we, we're too interested in, in avoiding suffering. And we're supposed to suffer. We were told that. And, and would you agree, Charles, that suffering as a Christian in America doesn't even compare to the suffering of so many Christians throughout history and even currently in other parts of the world. Suffering for me today, if I go and begin to boldly proclaim Christ in all the areas I can, suffering might mean I don't get invited to their Christmas party or they don't say nice things about me on social media. That's not really suffering. That's inconvenience. It may come to suffering. Yeah, not yet. It, it, it has, you know, all the seeds are sown so that maybe 20, 30 years from now, we might see that kind of suffering. I don't know. But I think you're right. Uh, we have to be willing to count the cost and stand up for what we believe and start somewhere. There's a ministry called Fixed Point Ministry. And their premise is the only thing that has to happen when the river's going downstream to show people in the stream that it's moving is to have a fixed point, like a pillar or a pylon in the middle of the river. So for most of us, that's what guarding the deposit is. Just hold on to what you have. Solid rock. And, and everybody going downstream, wait a minute, there's another alternative. Probably one of the, the best books 
that addresses uh, where we are today is Francis Schaeffer's last book, uh, written in the late 1980s called Christian Manifesto. Uh, he talked about um, living in a uh, post-Christian Western world and what postmodernism would bring. But he, he made a really chilling prediction there. He said that the next dictator that comes to power in a, a first-rate Western world that has the backing of tax money will have at its fingertips powers that Adolf Hitler never dreamed of, the paperback book, um, accessible radio and FM and AM, uh, television, subliminal influence, genetic engineering, uh, chemical manipulation of water supplies, um, uh, drug-induced docility, um, and uh, weapons of mass destruction. And he said all of that pretends that uh, for Americans who believe freedom is something we could never lose, we can lose it. And if we do lose it, we may never be able to get it back again. I know my redneck friends um, with all their guns think that uh, militia is gonna keep us free. Will you go up against a, a squad automatic weapon called a saw that fires a thousand rounds a minute with the United States military and you've got a two barrel shotgun? You're, you're not gonna hold up very long in that fight. And that's what he was talking about. And so what the text was saying through Steve today that which has been entrusted to us, it's better to never lose it than to lose it and try to get it back again. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve, I, th I think it's important to do this. Uh, this, is a, this, this group of men is a team. Uh, and you're stronger as a team as you are, than you are as an individual. And we need to build each other up. And we need to know the difference between temporal and eternal rewards. And I think of the price that I used to pay just to get my hand raised in a match and to get a medal uh, and how much easier it is to be able to stand for something that's correct and right and what you believe in. But you need help doing that. And, and we all need each other's help. Uh, that's why I do what's called encouragement Mondays now, but to get more and more people to realize Look, we have to start taking a stand now. We have to help now. You have to help other people because it's too easy to quit. Um, and like I said, I've said before, the only reason people, it's never over till you quit. And the only reason people quit is because they feel sorry for themselves. And America is getting to the point where they feel sorry for themselves. And they don't have any idea that they've lost the thankfulness that he's talking in here. And he, uh, and, they, and it's worth fighting for and, and, and believing in and, and building other people up. And the, here's the thing about it. It's, it says, for we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against prin principalities, wickedness on high places. So put on the full armor. Well, if you aren't studying God's word and then you're not standing, then you're, you're not ready to step out in the contest. And uh, we have to help each other. That's why I appreciate you and, and uh, Stephen sharing the word the way you do, and Stephen helping uh, get it out there, even now that that our, you know, that everybody's gone and things change. We still need each other's help and build each other's up and keep doing it in meetings like this. And uh, and then we'll, we'll be able to stand. And if we don't, uh, then, then it will fall. And uh, so I think it's important uh, to know who's in charge and support him and help each other take that stand. And I can say this because if, there wasn't any big, bigger center than I was. But, but, and I know I still fall short daily, but I, my daily, I, I get up morning and, and I pray and I ask for forgiveness. And I say, I hope I do better today. And I do the same thing when I go tonight. And uh, we all need to build each other up in that aspect and let each other know that, hey, we're okay. And we need to take a stand on that. And so I'm just telling you guys as part of my team, uh, as I did when I was on a national champion wrestling team, uh, man, it takes all of us. 
And uh, sometimes it's not the guy that's a superstar. Sometimes it's the guy that just doesn't get pinned. So um, all of us are important and let's try to stay together and help. Amen. You know, um, I, I was given a walk-in tour of about 30 Chinese professors of Hillsborough. And um, I showed them the house where the Confederates rode out from to uh, surrender from the Civil War. I showed them the hill that the regulators were hanged on after the Battle of Alamance. And I showed them the grave of um, Hooper who signed the Declaration of Independence. But I also showed them the Presbyterian meeting house where the North Carolina Assembly met in 1788 to vote on becoming the 12th state in the Union. And to the shock of the other 13 colonies, North Carolina voted not to become the 12th state. And I asked them if they knew why, and, and they didn't. And I said, because the Constitution did not yet have a Bill of Rights. And um, the next year we went back um, in New York and made a, a Bill of Rights and North Carolina voted to join the Union at that time. And one of the professors asked me, what are the Bill of Rights? Well, I was scrambling in my memory to, to, to say uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, a freedom to gather, a freedom to bear arms, uh, the right to a trial by jury, and so on and so forth. And one of the Chinese professors absolutely shocked me when he looked at me and said, Stephen, in my country, we have none of those rights. And I knew that, but I, I didn't know it on some level. And it shook me right down to my core and it's been rather astonishing the last 10 years to see more and more young people uh, decry our constitution as a white man's document or to see the Bill of Rights as something that um, really should be set aside because we can't afford to give people who disagree with us any voice or hearing. And it's really under attack in our uh, country today um, in many different levels and we need to, to, that's part of what we're guarding is our constitutional form of government. And I, I would not put that ahead of guarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, but as a citizen of the United States, that's something I think we need to guard very preciously too. That's part of being in the world, but not of the world. Yes. Yeah. Part of what you were saying, you know, I, I was listening to it, Stephen, thinking about <laughs> reflecting my years of different things happening as one what happened when one had a little birthday. And, uh, and then also in a time when we've had lots of quiet time, if you want to call it that. And I've been brought back to something that I've taught the hard way. And that was that when you accept Christ, the choice is then yours. The choice is always ours. In other words, now when I get up in the morning and I say to God, thank you for the day. What is it you have in mind? And then I'll listen to the news so that they don't make up my mind about what kind of a day it's going to be. I then can accept it and then say, now, how do you want me to use my day? And I found the other way around was uh, getting others to tune me in when I was a dean of students. Boy, I better not get that daily target for what they're going to tell about me headline. Bold is no good. And so I'd let the day get ruined by others. <laughs> The choice not being mine or the choice God said, I give you, I love you, I give you freedom. Now go forth. You didn't say, he didn't say, go it alone. That I'll go with you. Now go forth. 
And I found starting the day that way, rather than others starting my day, has made a difference. Um, uh, too soon old and too late smart. But uh, it has helped. Stephen so, Crox, so I've got a question for you. The professor that said that we don't have those things. Uh, what was his reaction to that? That that's just okay. We don't have them. Or he he said it with uh, genuine sadness. Oh, okay. Oh, probably, probably about ninety percent of the distinguished visiting Chinese professors would like to stay in America yeah. if they could find a. Um, a position, and if you ask them why, uh, their ready answer is freedom. Interesting. But yet, if they went back, they really are not in a position to fight for that freedom, evidently. Mm. Well, um, the the current is very strongly against them. Yeah. Since since I was there. Um, Three years ago, there's now a, a facial recognition system uh -huh. online, okay. and there's a camera in every underground church at the entrance and in the interior that uh, takes a picture and monitors who's coming to church. And they now have something like a social security account or card that... Um, that gives them a point system. If you're a Christian, that's minus points. If you're a member of the Communist Party, that's plus points. If you go to church, that's minus. If you subscribe to a Western news periodical or a Christian magazine, that's minus points. Wow. So your ability to get promoted or to move around in society is heavily monitored. And it's your point system that opens or closes doors to you. Mm. Wow. Dr. Taff, I think you wanted to get in there. I was going to say something. I mean, you all have heard me say this before, but if we look at history, uh, we are in somewhat desperate times. If, again, if, if you look at history and you look at the great cultures that have existed over time, the Mongols, the various Chinese dynasties, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, and on our own continent, the Maya and the Incas, the first thing that happened with every one of them, the thing that they all had in common is shortly before their demise, they started losing their religion. And you know, whatever it was, they started losing their religion. And that would suggest that we in the United States are a nation in decline. There are well, beautiful examples of of um, revival. You don't hear much um, today about what's often in history books called the bloodless revolution. But around uh, 1800, uh, France was sinking into the French Revolution and the guillotine. And that was followed by the dictatorship of Napoleon and and European wars, and people thought England would go the same way. Uh, slavery, child labor laws weren't in place, women were abused, the rich were getting richer, the environment was choked with yellow London fog from coal fires. And you might remember the opening line of Charles Dickens' book about it all, A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Worst of time. It's a brilliant quote you should go back and check out that is a moniker for today. And most people thought England was finished, but you had the preaching of John and Charles Wesley, of George Whitfield, and you had basically a revival. And very soon, William Wilberforce had ended slavery. Um, you had child labor laws and women labor laws that put a limit on the amount of hours you could work people. Um, the environment was cleaned up. The churches began to fill again. 
And like Tim Taft said, that integrating idea that a nation galvanizes around the gospel of Christ caused England to rise up and go another 150 years and really reach the greater zenith of its order. Now, it was exhausted after World War II and has slipped into decline. But we can have that type of through-going revival in the Western world, hopefully. If not, we'll either descend into a new dark age or the patience of God will run out and his return could be imminent. And we can't control those two, but we can control the fact that we're working and praying for revival. And I think one of, the, one of the things I would say is if, if, if your examples uh, motivate anything, we should be doing two things. We should be praying for God to raise up godly spokesmen in our country, whoever they may be, maybe people we don't even know the names of yet, to be a John or Charles Wesley, to be someone who will be the voice that we need to hear. But the second thing we need, I think, maybe in addition to that, or maybe if the other doesn't happen, and I used that quote earlier, we don't need a million dollar evangelist. We need a million one dollar evangelist. In other words, everybody do a little bit. That might be the secret sauce in revival for us in the next 20 years. Yeah. So that means all of us, all of us have had a deposit. We've been blessed. So let's give it out a little bit. Not like, not like Billy Graham, but let's give it a little bit. I believe in what you're saying is totally true. And you can look on this film and I'm glad sir, that I'm right in the same group, but we're all, we're all folks. That's all there is to it. And so if we're not helping our younger people understand the same thing, we're, we're, we're too old to save it. But we can, if you just take care of your own family, if I take care of my grandkids and my kids and I get them understanding, they get other people understanding, like you said, each one change one. And uh, we're all capable of still doing that. And that's what I meant about being a team and encouraging each other before, before you give up the ghost and make one final final stand and get a hold of your grandchild and talk to him and teach him and, and help him understand how important it is because uh, us doing it by ourselves, um, it is, it's not going to work. And that's hard because a lot of your grandkids are in that environment where they say, Bumpa, you're old. You don't know what you're talking about. But when they start to see some things and you can share one or two of those things, then it makes a difference. One thing, that, that's what I add. I'll, I'll, no, I just want to make one comment that it, from in my time of studying in Scotland in the seminaries, they, they often would say, you, you, Crazy Americans, you are such young, such a young country. Don't you understand? You have a long way to go. You're making make some new mistakes. You're making the same ones that we are, but you're acting as teenagers. Grow up. Look at all the mistakes we've made, and we're still around. Why don't you make some new mistakes? You're not. You're you're saying, uh, you're treating the truth as untruth. You're beginning to worship a lie. Don't you understand? That's not something new. We did it and look what happened to I'm us. Go Learn. I, well, what I was going to I was going to play off what Coach Lamb said and the example that Stephen shared. You know, I can decry what's happened with culture. I can be disappointed in the way that denominations have moved. But what I can take care of or at least assert it okay in wrestling you're on a team right and bill's right you encourage one another but when it comes time to compete you are by yourself it's what you do on the mat so what i'm convicted by steve's words is what am i going to do to guard the deposit myself wilberforce had tremendous odds against him yet one man through his uh faith and determination and, and dogged persistence was able to make a sea change in terms of the slave trade. One guy. Mm -hmm. So I I pray for revival. I worry about the culture. I think about uh, how churches have drifted. So what I've got to do is compete myself, be encouraged by brothers and sisters elsewhere 
<laughs> if it means sharing with my two-year-old granddaughter as we did last week, yeah, that's what that's what it means. That's in in our spheres of influence how small they happen to be. I think that's that's where I need to compete first. Yeah. I saw uh, the closest thing to revival I have seen in 52 years of ministry a few months ago in Virginia. I preached in a church up there and an attorney invited me to lunch and she said that she was assigned by a judge to be the attorney for an incompetent elderly person in a local rest home and she didn't want to do that but they said well she's old she'll be dead in six months and here it was 11 years later and the lady was still alive and she said I think she's a Christian but she's not very mentally competent would you come talk to her? And I said, well, sure. If you would go with me, I might scare her alone. And I said, and why don't we take her communion? So uh, we went out there the next time I went up there to preach. And um, the lady was uh, disheveled. She hadn't got out of her pajamas in months. But when I told her who I was, there was a light in her eyes. And when we offered her communion, she readily took it and knew what to do with the elements. Well, I got a phone call from that lawyer inviting me to come back and preach at that church. And she said, uh, Lydia had died two weeks earlier. And she said, when you come up here to preach, would you be willing to do a memorial service for her? She has no relative. She's 101 years old. And I, I just don't want to put her body in the ground and forget about her, at least say some words. And we'll have the funeral memorial service at the rest home, but I don't think anybody will come. Maybe a few will. So I agreed and we worshiped in the morning and had lunch and we went out to the rest home at two. And we were just praying two or three people would be there. And we went in the cafeteria and there were over 200 people in there. And they all were saying, oh, she was such a, a sweet woman. We didn't know her well because she wasn't very competent, but she had a, a sweet smile. And, you know, we die here and they carry us out feet first and nobody ever remembers us. And it's so wonderful that you're having a memorial service for these ladies. Well, I preached a very brief message about our hope for heaven and resurrection in Christ. Then I opened it up for Thanksgiving, and two hours later, we were still rejoicing over the gospel, and those elderly people who, who were very near to the gates of paradise, they didn't want to leave. It was, wow. it, they had found cool water, and I came home, and my wife always says, well, how did it go, honey? And, you know, how do you answer that? Well, I was in the right place, or... I couldn't begin to tell you in two hours the things I have seen today. But it, it's like revival broke out in a most unusual place. And if you study the history of revival, it begins often on the university campus among a group of students or in out of the way places like Wittenberg, Germany or Bethlehem Chapel with John Huss in Prague. Uh, just in a small town. And it can begin with people like us too. Let me share some encouraging news uh, on the Victory Channel, um, which is we found on YouTube, my wife and I've been watching. There's an evangelist called Mario Morillo. And um, he, God put it on his heart to start some tent revivals in California, Bakersfield, California, you know, and they put up these big tents and suddenly um, thousands of people and drug addicts and everything coming in off the street and just coming in. And and the word uh, was so moving. He said at some of these meetings that he had to stop the sermon because people were so overcome by the spirit. They were moaning and they needed release. They wanted to come forward and receive Christ and he said we would have to stop and just have a call and let people come up and receive Christ and he said it, we had we ended up having to stay for a whole week 
at this one place. And now they are, uh, they've, they've had a couple of these. Now they have ordered the biggest tent they could find. And it's coming by truck from New York all the way across the country. It's going to hold 3,000 people. I think they're going to be near Sacramento. Um, right now on March the 4th, they're meeting with other leaders church leaders in California, and they and they are seeing a revival in California. He even made the comment, we might see California flip red. <laughs> so there's, um, there's there, in the places where darkness is the darkest, is where the light shines the brightest. And we all know that California is a mess right now. And so God is at work in this country. And uh, I mean, I'm in Carborough. It's pretty dark here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm ready for uh, I'm ready for the light to shine bright here. So, yeah, we should just all be open to how God wants to use us. And that should be our prayer. How can he use us in this day and every day? And, and as as Bill Lamb mentioned, you know, each one can reach one less less the younger generation. I, I have two little boys and uh, every day I'm pouring into them. I never miss an opportunity to tell them that I love them and to show them that I love them and to sh to share. You know, we have Bible every night. We share. Uh, we share. We try to teach them what the world is is saying and what what where they're wrong and how people don't. That you're going to have to be the person who has to explain to people that what they're thinking is not right. They're being misled. They have an enemy. Um, and so each of us has a, you know, God did, we're not a mistake. God knew us before he stuck us in the womb. And uh, we have a purpose, each one of us. And, and we don't know, our purpose isn't done until he takes us home. So we need to be open and available to him. Here I am, Lord, use me mentality every day. So uh, let I, me do something. I know some guys are having to leave. Let me pray a quick prayer of commissioning. Uh, sometimes we pray that for missionaries and evangelists, but uh, I think we should pledge to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Amen. so help us God. <laughs> so if you'll bow with me, we'll hang on here later and talk some more, but let's just do that for the sake of those who need to leave. Well, Father, we are so grateful for those who have poured into our life, deposit upon deposit, from when we were the youngest and just barely could understand down to the present day where we're here today, listening again to the scripture speak to us. How grateful we are that there have been those that you brought on our path to grow our bank account with the knowledge of the gospel. So here we make a commitment and we make a decision that we will not stop that flow with just us but that we will go forth from a meeting like this and we will start making little deposits everywhere we go. And we will pour into our family and we will pour into our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, those that we know close and strangers that we'll meet tomorrow. Lord, let us hear again the Lord himself say, go into all the world and make disciples. And, and let us hear his words of promise that he's with us always, even to the ends of the earth. And some of us feel like we live there. We receive your commission and your blessing, not that we gain any trophies for you, for us, but we gain those trophies of grace for you. So we're going to need some help. We're going to need some words and timing strategy. But Lord, allow us to come back next week rejoicing that we were able to deposit some of this truth somewhere in the kingdom. And we were able to assist somebody to better know Jesus. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Therefore you are all sent. <laughs> Go Thank for it. Thank you. Thank you. Be well and be safe. Peace to